Today, I am speaking to Philip Tetlock, who quite simply is one of the greatest social scientists in the world. Up until now, we've been doing conversations with Tyler face to face, but for obvious reasons, Philip is in Philadelphia. He teaches at University of Pennsylvania, and I'm here in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, let's just jump right into it. Uh, first question, Philip, with our forecasters, do we want accuracy or do we want them to be a kind of portfolio to make us more aware of extreme events and possibilities? I think we want a lot of things from our forecasters and accuracy is often not the first thing. Um, I think that we want, for, uh, we look to forecasters for ideological reassurance. reassurance. Uh, we look to forecasters for entertainment. Um, and uh, we look to forecasters for uh, minimizing uh, regret functions of various sorts, uh, so that we would really regret not having anticipated X, Y, or Z, so we want to pump up the probabilities of those things. But if we take, say, the coronavirus, if we had had a few more extreme nuts who were maybe wrong most of the time, but insisting that we needed to fear the next pandemic, wouldn't we have been better off with that kind of portfolio, and thus we don't actually want more accuracy from our forecasters? Well, in some sense, we already did have that portfolio. There were, it was a main, mainstream position among epidemiologists for the last 20 years or so that you had a recipe for a disaster. Uh, David Epstein, the, the guy who recently wrote Range, a uh, uh, very interesting guy. You may have had him on your show. I don't know. But, but he, he recently uh, uh, quoted himself from a 2007 newsletter that he wrote. And, 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 and he said something like, the, the, the presence of a large reservoir of SARS-like viruses uh, among um, horseshoe bats, uh, combined with a culture of e eating uh, exotic uh, meats, uh, is um, is a time bomb. But what's the problem? Uh, and, and, and that was in my, that was in microbiology books. That was you know in the first decade of the twenty first century. That was it was common knowledge, and e indeed even before SARS one, even before the first for first SARS outbreak, and some epidemiologists prefer to call COVID nineteen SARS two. Uh, but even before SARS-1, uh, epidemiologists were acutely aware of this. So it's not as though we didn't have it in our portfolio. We, we, we did. So those forecasters maybe weren't entertaining enough. Isn't then the margin we want to work on to make our better forecasters more entertaining and not more accurate? <laughs> yes, no? Well, the signal to noise ratio isn't going to be great. I can assure you of that because there, there are plenty of people who are naturally more entertaining than epidemiologists. But maybe the whole portfolio needs to be more vivid rather than trying to fine tune the accuracy of particular parts of it, right? But, but you have lots of people competing in the marketplace of ideas for attention. And uh, that, that's a hard competition for scientists to, to beat. What do you think of the argument that science only exists at all because most scientists are overconfident, that if they were rational Bayesians, they would just latch on to the opinions of the smartest and best trained people before them, that there's only progress precisely because people are making forecasting mistakes? <laughs> right. So you, you hear versions of that argument, I suppose, on Wall Street as well. Sure. Um, uh, that, that's, that's an I, I, I think there's a good deal of truth to it. Um, I, I certainly have, have been guilty of overconfidence at many junctures of my career, thinking I'm going to be able to take on things that um, looked um, impossible and, and often turned out to be impossible. Uh, mo mo most projects that most scientists embark on, I think, don't succeed. Um, it does take a certain amount of um, quasi-irrational persistence. As with Columbus, right? or the founding of the United States, arguably was irrational to break away from the British Empire, right? Which was doing pretty well back then. It, 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 was, it, was, it, was a, a, it seemed like a risk-seeking move. But say I set up an alternate research program and I sought to take forecasters and A, make them more entertaining, and B, maybe I'd give them uppers so they were more overconfident. I mean, would that do the world good? Well, you could certainly have uh, induced the epidemiologists who are worried about the horseshoe bats in, in central China uh, or, or, other, or other possible sources of zoonotic viruses. You could certainly have induced them to pump up their probabilities. Uh, and you would, of course, started to run into a problem of crying wolf if they'd been saying there's a 30, 40, 50 percent chance of, um, of a viral leap into human beings each year and it, did, and it didn't happen, didn't happen, didn't happen. Um, people would, you, you get a crying wolf effect, right? Right. How do you think about financial markets in relation to your work on super predictors? 
Are financial markets, in essence, super predictors to begin with? Or can super predictors, on average, beat financial markets? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, um, you know, we, we, we play with prediction markets in with the work with the intelligence community. Going all the way back to Admiral Poindexter and the original DARPA effort to launch um, uh, prediction markets inside the intelligence community. I think your colleague Robin Hansen was involved with some of that work uh, around 2000, I would say around 2003, 2004, in that, in that range. Um, we, we've also been working with the prediction markets in parallel with forecasting tournaments, and there are pros and cons to each method of eliciting judgments. Uh, but the IC, the intelligence community, doesn't let us um, turn those markets, make those markets deep and liquid the way they are on Wall Street. Uh, people are essentially competing for reputational points the way they are in forecasting tournaments. The monetary prizes are either small or non-existent. So most economists, I think, would not consider that to be a very robust test of the efficacy of prediction markets. And then when prediction markets fall short, and they do typically not perform quite as well as forecasting tournaments, when they fall short, there's hardly a, 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 a decisive rebuke of the market mechanism for eliciting forecasts. Uh, I mean, there, are, there are lots of very powerful institutional actors like Goldman Sachs and so forth that are, are continually trying to do exactly what you describe. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's an ongoing process. You're, I don't need to, you're an economist, I don't need to tell you that. Sure. <laughs> I mean, there are implicit prediction markets in say the coronavirus, say prices of airline stocks, right? And those are very liquid. They've been very thickly traded lately. They have indeed. If you took your 10 best super forecasters and brought them into the hedge fund people at Goldman Sachs and you all sat down together, who would be teaching whom? <laughs> it's, it's, it's an interesting experiment. And, and you know, the, the person, okay, it, when we, the, my project manager from the first uh, set of forecasting tournaments, uh, Terry Murray, founded a company, Good Judgment Incorporated, which does things like that. Um, so that's a proprietary venture, uh, and you know, bringing, you would want, probably want to talk to Terry about how successful or not successful they've been in doing that. I think they've had some success. I think it's extremely hard to do that. Uh, it's non-trivial. I, I think there's a good deal of similarity in the cognitive ability, cognitive style profiles of super forecasters and the kinds of people you see on the staffs of Goldman Sachs, um, and it, it, would, it would be a tight race. What about uh, the sports betting market? Do you think there are inefficiencies in that because they don't have enough super forecasters? I'm not an expert on sports betting. I'm better to talk to Nate Silver about that. But let me put the question more generally. There are many markets out there which predict something. Sports betting markets are simply the most obviously most explicit about prediction. Mm -hmm. So if there was something the world didn't know about prediction already, those markets should be inefficient. Yes or no? Why would you think the answer would be yes? Well, let's say that people favored the home team too much. So too many people might bet on the New York teams, the Los Angeles teams, and then the odds would be skewed. So right. if there's a bias in people without super forecasting techniques, we would expect sports odds to somehow be off, or at least they would have been off before your work was published. Well, or, well, the, our, our arbitrage predate, predated super forecasting. Well, but isn't arbitrage itself super forecasting, right? People are arbitrage yes, form. Yes, on I the basis of yeah. some set of information. I think that's fair. Yeah. Uh, so all these markets out there, do you think they are, without you already, the best available super forecasters? Um, the term best is a, it's a term I'm just not comfortable with. <laughs> I, 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 I rather doubt that they're at the optimal forecasting frontier at the moment. Uh, but they're, 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 they're often pr pr probably fairly close. And uh, is, there, is, is there room to incentivize people to uh, out, out predict the market? Well, that's one of those paradoxes that economists have written about, right? When people predict out to many decimal places, do you think that's absurd or do you think it's useful? The op what's the optimal level of granularity for different categories of forecasts? Um, I think for the kinds of things we were looking at in the IARPA original forecasting tournaments with geopolitical events, like how long the Syrian civil war would last or what would Russia do in the Eastern Ukraine or things of that sort, 
Um, yes, it would be absurd to go to three or four decimal points. Um, originally, the uh, National Intelligence Council, which synthesizes a lot of uh, intelligence analysis, uh, originally, um, they only distinguished five degrees of uncertainty, and they didn't, they didn't uh, put numbers on it. More recently, they've moved to seven degrees of uncertainty, and they do put numerical ranges on it. So you know, somewhat likely represents a certain probability range. Um, now, in our work, we've explored how, um, how granular it's been, it's been, uh, the, be the best forecasters are, uh, doing various rounding experiments where we round their forecasts off to the nearest tenth, that kind of thing. Uh, and see whether or not, if, 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 if it's pseudo precision, if when they adjust, when they move from point, point 0.6 to point 0.65, for example, if on average that doesn't you know, improve their accuracy, uh, we, we would conclude that, you know, that they, they can't achieve that level of granularity. Um, our best statistical estimates are that our, our forecasters for the types of questions the intelligence community often poses can distinguish between 10 and 15 degrees of uncertainty which is considerably more than the seven they think they can now, a lot more than the five they thought they used to be able to distinguish. Um, but how useful is it to be able to distinguish very varying degrees of uncertainty is going to hinge on the kind of game you're playing. If it's poker, uh, you know, you might well be uh, on someone who's very adept at distinguishing things to uh, say three decimal points. If you could take just a bit of time away from your research and play in your own tournaments, are you as good as your own best super forecasters? I, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't think I have the patience or the temperament for doing it. Uh, I did make, I did give it a try in the second year of the first set of forecasting tournaments back in 2012. And I monitored, I, I monitored the aggregates. Uh, we, we, we had a, an aggregation algorithm that was performing very well at the time and it was outperforming 99.8% you know, of the forecasters from whom the, the composite was derived. So if I simply had predicted what the composite said at, any, at, at, at each point in time in that tournament, I would have been a super, super forecaster. I would have been better than 99.8% of the, uh, the super forecasters. Um, so even though I knew that <laughs> it, would be, it was unlikely that I could outperform the composite, I did research some questions where I thought the, uh, the composite was excessively aggressive, um, and I tried to second guess it. And the net result of my efforts, instead of finishing in the top, you know, 0.02 percent or whatever, I, I, I was, uh, I think I finished in the middle of the super forecaster pack. Um, so that doesn't mean I'm a super forecaster. It just means that when I tried to make forecasts better than the composite, I degraded the accuracy significantly. But what do you think is the kind of patience you're lacking? Because if I look at your career, you've been working on these databases on this topic for what over 30 years. That's incredible patience, right? more patience than most of your super forecasters have shown. So is there some disaggregated notion of patience where they have it and you don't? <laughs> um, yeah, they, they, they have a skill set. I mean, and in, more, most, in the most recent tournaments we've been working on with them, that the, the, this, this becomes even more evident that their, their, their willingness to delve into the details of, of really pretty obscure problems um, for very minimal compensation uh, is, is quite, a, quite, a, quite extraordinary. They, they are, intrinsically cognitively motivated in a way uh, that it is, is, um, is quite remarkable. Um, what, what's, how am I different from that? Um, I, I guess I have a little bit of attention deficit disorder and my attention tends to roam. So I've not just worked on forecasting tournaments. I mean, I, I've, I've been fairly persistent in pursuing this topic since the mid 1980s, you know, back when, even before Gorbachev became general party secretary, I was doing a little bit of this. Um, but I, I, I've been doing a lot of other things as well on, on, the, on the side, um, and so my, 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 my attention tends to roam. I'm, I'm interested in taboo trade-offs, I'm interested in accountability. There are various uh, things I've studied that uh, don't quite fall in this rubric. Doesn't that make you more of a fox, though? You know something about many different areas. I could ask you about antebellum American discourse before the Civil War, and you would know who had the smart arguments and who didn't, right? Well, I would know who has arguments to take the more integratively complex forms on the one hand, on the other hand, and then synthesis. Uh, whether you want to consider those arguments smarter or not <laughs> is, is, is another matter. Um, but yes, I, I, it is, um, I, I, I suppose that's fair. I mean, I, I've always resonated a little more to the foxes than to the hedgehogs, but I, I think when you look at the great achievements in science, they often come from hedgehogs. If you look today at the ongoing debates about coronavirus and what will happen, and I mean now the debates 
amongst the smart people, the people you respect. What is the mistake you see them making? The biggest mistake. Oh, you want me to be an amateur epidemiologist here, right? <laughs> no, mistake in reasoning. You don't have to give your numerical estimate. Procedurally, what are they not getting right? Well, is it a mistake uh, if you're a public health expert who uh, feels that there, that one mistake is much worse than the other. It's much better to overestimate the threat of the virus than to underestimate it because you have to influence public opinion and public behavior. Uh, there you're not forecasting, you're engaged in manipulation, social influence. Uh, so you, I mean, this it comes back to your original question about you know, what do we want from our forecasters? Um, and accuracy is only one of the things we want from them. Uh, we, we, we look to forecasters for a lot of things, whether to inspire confidence, to inspire fear, and so forth. If uh, we're trying to estimate how much people cut back on their risk-taking behavior because they're afraid of the virus, right. are the group of people best suited to do that epidemiologists, some other social scientists, or your super forecasters? Maybe even economists, right? We study elasticities. Why should it be the epidemiologists? I, I think you'd want an interdisciplinary team. I, I think there's a, 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 I mean, diversity is one of these words that's been reduced to a cliche, but I, I think we, we have found in our work that cognitive diversity helps. Um, and it helps in certain quite well-defined ways. I mean, if you want to create a composite that outpredicts the vast majority of the super forecasters, a good way to do it is not only to take the most recent forecast of the best forecasters in the domain, uh, but it's also to um, extremize that forecast to the degree that people who normally disagree agree with each other. And when you have that, when you have convergence among diverse observers, uh, that's a signal that the uh, weighted average composite is probably too conservative and you should extremize. Does the team, the diverse team, have a CEO, someone in charge? Uh, not in this case, no. That's, that's done purely statistically. But would you put someone in charge? Now, maybe the person in charge would implement that statistical algorithm, right? But who's the person you would put in charge of the team? An epidemiologist, yourself, mm -hmm. your best super forecaster, Bill Gates? Uh, uh, that's a matter of managerial skill. And I, I would say, you know, going back to my old, one of my old dissertation advisors at Yale 40 plus years ago, Irv Janis on Groupthink, I would pick a leader who knows how to shut up uh, and not reveal opinions at the beginning of the meeting and, and knows how to listen. And which group of people do you think that best describes? Um, I think a lot of good executives have the intuition that you get more out of a team of forecasters or problem solvers if you initial, if you elicit independent judgments initially that are uncontaminated by conformity pressure, and then you create an environment in which ideas can be freely critiqued uh, before lifting the veil of anonymity and letting people see who's taking which positions. Do you think having machine learning and artificial intelligence has made us much better at forecasting things right now? Well, certain I mean, so, certain social categories events. of things for sure. <laughs> sure, at the micro level, but social events. Whether there'll be a recession, how many people will die from the coronavirus, uh, will we settle Mars? <laughs> uh, well, IARPA just ran a forecasting tournament called Hybrid Forecasting Competition in which they pitted, pitted um, algorithmic approaches and human approaches and hybrid approaches against each other. Um, and, um, I, you know, I, I should let IARPA speak for itself about how well its programs work or don't work. I, 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 don't, I don't think there's a lot of evidence to support the, the claim that uh, um, machine intelligence is well equipped to take on the sorts of problems that the intelligence community wanted to have answered when it runs the forecasting tournaments it's been running uh, with, with our research team. Um, the, the things like the Syrian civil war, Russia, Ukraine, uh, settlement on Mars. Uh, though, though it, 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 these, are, these are events for which uh, base rates are elusive. Uh, it's not like you're, you're, you're screening credit card applicants for visa and <laughs> you're, you're, you know, you, you don't, machine intelligence is going to dominate human intelligence totally. Machine intelligence dominates humans in Go and chess. Uh, it may now dominate human, humans in poker. I don't know that we're, what the state of the art is quite there yet, but but you know it, it, it's in their Starcraft or you know whatever the next thing that Dennis Osabis is going to conquer. Um, so, but no, I, I don't see evidence that uh, those approaches work uh, in the domains that we we um, 
we study uh, with, with the intelligence community. So do you think the hybrid man machine approaches are overrated? No, I don't think it's, I, I think it's a matter of, it's very domain specific. Um, it's, it sounds like a great idea, <laughs> who, who could be against it? Um, but the devil lurks in the details and it, it doesn't deliver as automatically as you might hope. It, it, it's trench warfare here. Do you think the world as a whole is becoming easier to predict or harder to predict? And again, I mean social events. Um, I'm not sure there's a definite trend one way or the other. I, you hear a lot of talk, a lot of claims that there are, but you know, if you look back on the 20th century, there certainly were <laughs> lots of major pockets of unpredictability. Um, uh, not, it's, not, it's not clear. What if I say, again, current events aside, but it seems easier to predict. There hasn't been a, a, a world war since 1945. Uh, there's been steady economic growth in most parts of the world. Uh, more peace. Isn't that easier to predict? You just predict 2 to 4% global economic growth, and you pick up a fair amount of what's happened since 1950? Uh, indeed. So, well, simple extrapolation algorithms are, are historically are, are hard to beat. And if, if you, you know, we just we're running a COVID-19 uh, mini forecasting tournament right now, and, and they're proving to be hard to beat. Um, the, the the skill, of course, is when 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 to um, when to alter the trend, uh, the, whether to accelerate it or to decelerate it or or or, or to change direction. Um, and do you have a personal intuition on that? Um, uh, I, I think humans have been repeatedly humbled in competitions against uh, simple statistical algorithms. Uh, going back to Paul Meal, his famous little book on clinical versus actuarial approaches to predicting um, uh, in medicine and psychiatry. Um, so uh, I, I would say be humble. Now there's some of your early research that if I read it properly suggests that making people accountable leads to more evasion and self-deception on their part. Are you worried that your work with pundits by trying to make them more accountable will lead to more evasion and self-deception from them? Or how do you square early tetlock and mid-period to late tetlock? <laughs> it's actually not, not, not too difficult in that particular case. Um, it really depends on the type of accountability. Tur tournaments create a very stark monistic type of accountability in which one thing and only one thing matters, and that is that your accuracy. Um, and you, you get you get no, you, you get no points for uh, playing to your, for being an ideological cheerleader and pumping up the probabilities of things that your team wants to be true, or downplaying the probabilities of the things your team doesn't want to be true. You take a reputational hit. Uh, so the incentives are very unusually tightly aligned to favor accuracy. That's extremely unusual in the social world. Most forms of accountability occur in organizational uh, settings in which uh, there are lots of distortions at work. Um, and uh, the, the, ra the rational political response for a decision maker located in most accountability matrices and organizations is to engage in uh, some mixture of strategic attitude shifting toward the views of important others, or as you put it, uh, d d evasion, procrastination, and so forth. But given that when a pundit is on, say, the evening news, there's not a little box at the bottom that gives the Tetlock score of that pundit, correct? So most people don't know the actual record. So given that out there somewhere is a measure of how good or bad the pundit is, uh, are you worried that in a sense you will make those pundits run further away from objective standards precisely because they do poorly by them? I don't know if we can make them run much further away from objective standards than they already are. But um, you know, it, 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 um, that, that, that's, a, that's a very interesting, interesting point uh, about forecasting tournaments. And I look at the kinds of people who are attracted to participate in them. I mean, we, 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 at the very outset, I mean, I invited lots of big shots to participate in forecasting tournaments, and they, they turn, turned me down. They've repeatedly turned me down. Um, at, at a very interesting correspondence from William Sapphire in the 1980s about forecasting tournaments, we could talk a little about later. But um, the, the upshot of this is that. Young people who are upwardly mobile see forecasting tournaments as an opportunity to rise. Old people like me, you know, aging baby boomer types who occupy a relatively high, high status inside organizations, uh, see forecasting tournaments as a way to lose. Uh, you know, the, the best, if I'm a senior analyst inside the, um, an intelligence agency and I'm, say I'm on the National Intelligence Council and I'm an expert on China, 
uh, and the go-to guy for the president on China. Uh, and some upstart R&D operation called Lyarpha says, hey, we're going to run for these forecasting tournaments in which we assess how well the analytic communi community can put probabilities on what Xi Jinping is going to do next. Um, and I'll be on a level playing field competing against 25-year-olds, 65-year-old. Uh, how, how am I likely to react to this proposal, to in, in this, this new method of doing business? It doesn't take a lot of um, empathy or bureaucratic imagination to suppose I'm going to try to nix this thing. Which nation's government in the world do you think listens to you the most? <laughs> you know, I... I, hmm. I you say, may not know, right? I, I, I might, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I suppose the, the most prominent political fan I have at the moment is probably uh, the, the, one of the senior advisors to Boris Johnson, uh, Dominic Cummings, who... Um, recently uh, caused a bit of a stir in, in, in the UK um, by appointing um, a, a super forecaster who had um, uh, written uh, some blogs that people uh, interpreted as uh, misogynist or racist or fascist or eugenicist or I, I don't know, some mixture of, of all those things. But I think his name was Andrew Sabisky, he was a young man, 24, 25, the kind, you know, the kind of person young people are attracted, as I said before, to forecasting tournaments. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a fast track toward upward mobility because you have all the high status people making vague verbiage forecasts, <laughs> people like me. Um, but do you think Cummings actually is influenced by you? Because as I understand what he's doing, correctly or not, he thinks he knows a bunch of things that other people do not. And that seems somewhat non Tedlockian, right? So maybe you're part of his portfolio of ideological armor. But maybe he's actually very non tetlockian and it's the people in Singapore who are your true fans. Well, there are some people in Singapore too, uh, and, and that's an interesting, it's an interesting place. You should mention that. Interesting you should bring that one up. But uh, well, well, Mr. Cummings um, and Mr. Gove both separately brought up my work at various points and during the Brexit, Brexit debate. And uh, Michael Gove, uh, at least in the UK, famously said that Britain had had enough of experts. Uh, I don't know if you remember that that of course that particular quote, but um, and he 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 was thinking of, of well he he he's, you know, he invoked a support at least for that position uh, expert political judgment, in which portions of that book uh, you know compare uh, subject matter experts to minimalist statistical baselines like you know uh, extrapolate can you predict simple extrapolation algorithms and, and the answer was often no. Uh, so he's, you know, the goal was raising the point that, you know, where, what are these guys, where do these guys get off making these uh, confident predictions about the consequences of Brexit when uh, the best empirical evidence would suggest they're probably not materially more accurate than simple extrapolation algorithms. So it was, you know, that that, that was brought up. It was brought up for a political reason. Was, he, he had a political point to make. Um, and I think this, and, and, and Dominic Cummings had a, has a political point to make as well. He, feel, he fears that I think parts of the civil service are hostile toward Brexit and, and want to undermine uh, the, the Boris Johnson uh, administration objectives. Now, this, I think this comes to something deeper now. It's, it's, it's not just about the UK. It's, it's about the intellectual fissure that exists between social science and conservatives. Uh, that most social scientists are liberal. Um, and conservatives are, are wary of advice from social scientists. I, I think we may have partly paid some price for that uh, in this epidemiological, in, in this, in the, uh, to put it kindly, the slowness of the Trump administration response to COVID-19. Yes, now you brought up Britain. If we look back at speeches in the British House of Commons, who is giving the most cognitively complex speeches? <laughs> I can't, you know, Bob Putnam collected those data that I, I reported the stu I reported that, 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 that study in 1984, uh, but Bob Putnam collected the original data and he reported it in a book, Beliefs of Politicians, published in the 1970s, and I think those data were based on, on interviews with members of the British House of Commons. They were, not, they were not speeches, they were interviews, confidential interviews that Bob Putnam got access to uh, and uh, put a lot of work into obtaining, and um, he shared them with me and I I, I, I used them as grist for um, a small research program I was running in the 1980s on cognitive style and political ideology, trying to te tease apart the rigidity of the right versus the ideologue hypotheses. So. And who sounds the smartest from that period? Uh, in that period, it was uh, it was a, um, a mixture of moderate labor, moderate conservative. It was it was the centrists that did better.
it, it was slightly left, left shifted. Do you think we can draw any inferences from that about politics? Should we have more faith in the people who sound smarter or not at all? Well, I think that particular measure in integrative complexity is, is, is I, I think it does have some correlation with, with, with forecasting accuracy. Um, but I think you're, all, you're picking up something more than just forecasting accuracy. You're picking up what I call value pluralism. Uh, you're picking up uh, a tendency to endorse values that are often in conflict with each other. So the more frequently that you, as a political thinker, confront cognitive dissonance between your values, your value orientations, the more pressure you are to engage in integratively complex synthetic thinking. Uh, when, 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 when your values are more lopsided, it's easier to engage in what we call simpler modes of cognitive dissonance reduction, like denial or bolstering and spreading, spreading of the alternative. So we downplay one value, push up the other value, and make your life stress-free. Um, but some value, uh, some ideological positions at some points in history um, require more tolerance for dissonance, and some people are more inclined to fill those roles. And you think those politicians are also likely to be better forecasters? Um, you know, we're not talking about huge effect sizes here, or the sure. integrated, integrative complexity. I, I think that uh, fluid intelligence is probably a more powerful predictor, but integrative complex, a combination of fluid intelligence and integrative complexity, I think does, 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 does boost uh, forecasting accuracy, yes. And if you were running the CIA, those people who are pluralistic in the manner you just outlined, would you promote them more rapidly? Yeah. Now, of course, the CIA, bear in mind, is by, by statute supposed to be value neutral. It, it's not, they're, they're supposed to be feeding impartial, apolitical advice. Just, but just no the one facts. believes that, right? Well, I, I, that, that is supposed to be the division of labor here. Now, is it, is it, and forecasting tournaments are, one, I think one reason they may be interested in forecasting tournaments is because forecasting tournaments incentivize people to do one thing and only one thing, and that's accuracy. You don't, you don't get points for skewing your, your judgments toward your favored cause. You, you, you take a hit on the long term by doing that. If you were in charge of the CIA and had a free hand, how would you reform it? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, um, there's a long history to efforts to reform the CIA, you know, going back to 19, well, it was founded in 1947. There have been various efforts since then. Uh, people have been unhappy with the CIA for many reasons o over time, you know, Vietnam being a big one, but, but uh, there are lot, lot, lots of other reasons uh, that, that people have, have expressed unhappiness. Both liberals and conservatives have at various points been unhappy with, with the performance of, of the intelligence community. In 2001, it came to a, came to a kind of a crisis point, I think, uh, and, and then there was a commission to reform uh, intelligence analysis, and, ap and after d the WM uh, WMD fiasco in Iraq that the pressure grew even more. Um, one reason why we're even talking right now today is that the intelligence community was forced essentially by uh, the recommendations of the of the Reform Commission uh, to take keeping score more seriously, uh, to take training for accuracy and, and, and monitoring of accuracy more seriously. And I think that they create the, that's when uh, they created the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, which is the R&D branch housed within the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And its job is to um, um, uh, support uh, innovative research that will improve uh, the quality of intelligence analysis, where you know, that, that can be defined in various ways. But, but accuracy is certainly an, one, one a very important component of that. Uh, but it's, it's not just, but it's not accuracy with a liberal skew or a conservative skew. It's supposed to be just plain, just the facts, ma'am, accuracy. But what questions uh, so, so, they choose so, to predict, right? That reflects values, obviously. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Which questions they choose to predict, that reflects values. Whenever a bureaucracy tells me they're value free, I start getting more suspicious very quickly, right? <laughs> I never believe them. It might be okay for them not to be value free, but the cynical response is the correct one here. Um, well, indeed, uh, you know, there is, it's a, you, the old expression, there's no view from nowhere. Uh, there, there is no such thing as pure value neutrality. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not something worth aspiring to, uh, but, um, you're, you're, but you're right. The, the, the values off, even if you had a perfectly objective forecasting tournament system, if you had people that are generating the questions and having, uh, promoting a political agenda, you could skew the results. I think that's one of your points, right? Now, in the middle of all these discourses, we have a segment called overrated versus underrated. And I'll toss out a few names, ideas, and you tell me if you think they're overrated or underrated. How's that? Okay. 
Philadelphia, the city of Philadelphia, overrated or underrated? I got endless grief when I, when my wife and I decided to to to, to leave Berkeley and, and move to Philadelphia. They, they people thought that we were we were, we were borderline insane. Um, and but we left for for for, for very personal reasons, and not, um, and without going into what what what, what those were. Um, I, I would say Philadelphia has been a moderately pleasant surprise. It's, it's a city that has many, many, many problems, uh, uh, but um, it's, it's, not, it's not as bad as the people, people in Northern California thought it was. Tolstoy. You know, I haven't, I read a little bit of Tolstoy and I've seen a number of films. <laughs> and I, I, I know some of the shorthand versions and I know that Isaiah Berlin had a hell of a time classifying Tolstoy as a hedgehog or a fox. Um, but uh, but um, I don't think I'll pass on that one. John Cleese. He's commented on you. You're allowed to comment on him. Right. Well, um, he gave me, he, I, he, I had a wonderful time as a kid watching Monty Python. So uh, he, and, and also Faulty Towers. So I, I, I really enjoyed his, 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 I've enjoyed his comedy. I, I haven't followed him uh, since then. Um, but when I was younger, I thought he was absolutely hilarious and brilliant. And um, I, I, I appreciate the, the, the flattering things he said about my work. The television show, The Sopranos. I, I fell for it. Uh, and I, I love I, James Gandolfini. Uh, I, I, I fell in love with his performances, and and then when he he he, you know, one of the last things he did is he played Leon Panetta in Zero Dark Thirty, and there he is, you know, eliciting forecasts from people in the CIA about whether Osama bin Laden is in that compound in Abbottabad. Is he there or isn't he effing there? Uh, great, wonderful. God, well, I did never knew him, but I I, I, um, I think very highly of his work. The threat of terrorism, do we overrate it or underrate it in the United States? That's a very difficult question uh, because of the tail risk aspect to it. Uh, if, you, if you looked at the, you know, the number of people who died from terrorism versus other causes, it would seem that the amount of money we spend on uh, uh, suppressing terrorism would, would be disproportionate. Um, but the, the tail risk uh, complicates that a lot. What is your favorite movie? Uh, I don't have a hierarchy like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing comes to mind. What's the movie you've seen the greatest number of times that you can count? I, I don't know if I watch movies from no, that often uh, over and over. Um, I did see myself coming back uh, just very recently, like last week in the quarantine period, uh, to Westworld. It's not a movie. It's it's a it's a, it's a, it's a series, of course. But um, I I, th I think that is. Um, Quite, quite. I think the first two seasons were quite, quite brilliant. On historical counterfactuals, by what year do you think the ascent of the West was more or less inevitable? Well, I, I have inside information here. We, 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 we did, we did a survey of some very prominent historians. Yes. <laughs> we reported it in that book on making the West. Uh, we reported part of it anyway, also in an article on American Political Science Review. Um, I, I, I think that the, if you looked at the, just the unweighted average of judgments for the median, I think was probably around 1730, 1740. And you think after that, it was not very contingent? Uh, that, 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 would, that would have been, you see, I'm, I'm not a historian of the West. I mean, I, I, what, what, what do I really know about that? I'm, I'm simply reporting the news here. And is there any great hinge of contingency that you think about looking backwards like oh my goodness if there hadn't been a reformation or if there hadn't been a council of trent or or what well i i you know i'm i'm a fan of steve pinker uh i, I think the enlightenment was a big deal because it got people thinking more rationally yeah and and, more and in that, terms of science and that had huge huge spillover effects um now, could there have been an enlightenment in china or, or you know, could the chinese have created certain types of technologies without science um what, what if they hadn't scuttled their navy in around 1400? Um, <laughs> they're all, all those sorts of counterfactuals. Um, and how, yeah. necess how necessary or contingent, contingent do you think it is that we keep on thinking in enlightenment-like terms? Is it once you're locked into it, it keeps on going? Or is it like good government that you have yeah. to renew it every generation or two? Well, I see the work I'm doing is very much in the spirit of the enlightenment. Uh, public transparent standards of evidence for judging uh, subject matter expertise. Um, 
I, I think one of the great challenges of our time is, is striking the right balance between democracy and technocracy. And I, I think the, the, the fissures that have emerged, it's not just, you know, conservatives are, 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 are very skeptical of social science and it's apparently some parts of biological science too, which is I, I think very unfortunate. But you see this kind of some reflexive skepticism towards science on the left as well. So, I mean, how, how do you manage demo the, the relation between small d Democrats and technocrats uh, in, in a society in which um, a, 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 a ex expert guidance is, is increasingly crucial? What are you learning from playing the game Civilization V, or at least watching others do so? <laughs> That's a good example, actually, of why I'm not a super forecaster. Uh, I, I, I don't play Civilization V, but Civilization V was one of the uh, simulations that IARPA chose uh, to feature in its counterfactual forecasting tournaments under the rubric of FOCUS. Uh, and if any of your listeners are interested uh, in signing up to be forecasters for FOCUS, uh, we still have one more round, round five, and we will be recruiting people. Um, but but I, again, it reflects my temperament. I don't have the patience for a game like Civ Five that, that, that requires a lot. You know, there's a forecasting is all is inevitably a mixture of fluid and crystallized intelligence, and um, uh, you have to invest a lot of energy uh, into mastering a game like 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 Civilization Five. And I suppose as people get older, they may they become less likely to make those kinds of cognitive investments. I mean, it becomes more and more essential as I get older, I think, to, to focus on the things where I have a, have a real comparative advantage. The best chess players are all young, right? This we know. There's clear yeah. data. Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting the domains in which child prodigies emerge, uh, music and, and, and chess and uh, math. If we take super counterfactualists, and super forecasters, do those two groups basically overlap or how do they differ? I think they have to be rather intimately connected, although disentangling this one is going to be really, really hard. And it's one of the things I do want to dedicate a few years of my life to doing. Uh, now, obviously, when you say someone a good counterfactualizer, it, 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 some people shrug their shoulders and they say, well, how are you possibly going to know whether you, know, you would have gotten where they undo the assassination of the Archduke in 1914? Do you undo World War I? Undo Hitler? Do you, do you, do you undo World War II? Uh, you make Kennedy grouchier during the Cuban Missile Crisis? Do you trigger World War III? Um, you, you've got these sorts of arguments that are essentially unresolvable. Uh, you can't rerun history. You can rerun Civilization V, <laughs> but you can't rerun history. Um, uh, so that makes counterfactuals um, a place where, where ideologues can retreat. Uh, they can make up the data, make up whatever facts they want to, to justify pretty much whatever, what, no, no matter how, how, how bad, they, no matter how bad the war in Iraq went, you can always argue that things would have been worse <laughs> if Saddam Hussein had remained in power. So you have these counterfactual, you have these factual and counterfactual reference points that people use in debates implicitly to, to make, to make rhetorical points. Um, so, so a lot of people, part of what attracted to me to counter, counterfactuals was A, how important they are in drawing any lessons from history, B, how important they are in policy arguments, and C, how unresolvable they are. Now, one of the things I think we're hoping to do in the FOCUS program is to develop some objective metrics for identifying people and methods of, of generating probabilities that uh, pr produce superior counterfactual forecasts in simulated worlds in which you can rerun history and assess, you know, what the probability distributions of possible worlds are. Well, it turns out, you know, you get World War One 37% of the time, even if you undo the assassination of the Archduke, and you get something like World War II, uh, you get you see where we're going. Um, so we're hoping uh, that uh, one, one result of focus will be to help us identify pe uh, people and methods that, uh, that generate superior counterfactual forecasts in domains where there is a ground truth. Uh, the next task will be to connect superior performance in simulated worlds to superior performance in the actual world. Now, this is where things get tricky, of course, because in the actual world, we don't have these, um, the, the ground truth. So if I ask you a counterfactual question of the form, you know, if NATO uh, hadn't expanded eastward um, uh, as far as it did in 2004 into the Baltics, uh, NATO, US, NATO, NATO, Russia relations would, would be considerably friendlier than they are now. 
Are chess players good forecasters? Uh, but do you want to go with this for a second? Sure. No, sorry. There, I there, thought there, you there. Were Yeah. No, no, I don't want to stop on that one. <laughs> no, keep on going. So, yeah, we've got a counterfactual there. Now, we can't rerun history. We, we don't know how, well, how relations with Russia would be if, we had, if NATO hadn't gone into the Baltics. Right. If Russia would have gobbled up the Baltics. Maybe, maybe Russia would be friendly or feel less threatened. You have people who have uh, more hawkish or more dovish mental models of Russia. And those mental models predispose them to give you certain canned, almost ideologically reflexive answers to those counterfactuals, right? Right. Um, now, you, you, so you can, but you can measure what people's beliefs are in the counterfactual. And then you can measure people's beliefs about conditional forecasts that are logically connected to the counterfactuals in a kind of a Bayesian inference network. So you can measure, you know, what, we, we, if, if I know that you, you, you think that the Russians would be every bit as nasty and snarly, <laughs> Even if we hadn't um, moved it moved into the into the Baltic, they might even be nastier. Uh, it's probably a fair bet that you're also likely to think it's, it's it's a good idea to increase arms sales to the Ukraine, ratchet up sanctions on on Putin's cronies, and so forth. Um, so we can identify um, the the counterfactual belief correlates of more or less accurate conditional forecasting. And in that sense, you can indirectly validate or invalidate, you can render more or less plausible certain counterfactual beliefs. That's, that, that's the longer term objective of this research program. It's, to, it's not just, <laughs> we're not playing Civilization Five for the sake of sure. you know, getting better at Civilization Five. We're, 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 the ultimate goal is to link the sophistication of counterfactual reasoning about the past to the, uh, the subtlety and the accuracy of conditional forecasts going into the future. Um, another thing you should observe, by the way, if people are becoming better counterfactual reasoners, is you should observe less ideological polarization in their counterfactual beliefs. Yes. So uh, just uh, the counterfactual beliefs should become as ideologically depolarized as conditional forecasts are. Does playing World of Warcraft a lot help you become a better forecaster or playing chess? <laughs> Um, I don't have any evidence bearing on either of those things, uh, but you know, there's a, there's a third variable problem there too. But you get used to a test, right? You know, if you lose, there's very yeah. little self-deception. This is true. Uh, I mean, the, the people who do well in these sorts of things often like games like that. Venture capitalists, when they try to spot talent in others, do you interpret their behavior in terms of a super forecaster model? Someone like Peter Thiel, he found Mark Zuckerberg, Reid Hoffman, Elon Musk. He's a kind of super forecaster. How do you super forecast talent and other people? Well, it really helps uh, to be working in an environment in which super bright people are not super rare. It's very, very hard to forecast, uh, to, to identify talent when, when, when the base rate falls below one in a thousand, one in 10,000, one in 100,000. You're looking for a needle in a haystack. Uh, but the, the, this, the great advantage, advantage that venture capitalists in Silicon Valley have is that uh, the talent pool is relatively rich. So there, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, quite a few flaky people that come by seeking their money for sure. Uh, but but the, <laughs> their, their, their odds of success are significantly better uh, than, you, than they would be if they're working from a population base rate. And of course, they can tolerate a lot of mistakes because just That's a few hits will, 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 will pay for a lot of false positives. But some do much, much better than others, right? Mike Moritz, Peter Thiel. Right. The, the question is, are they doing better because they have a bet, bet, better social networks? Are they doing better or they have better judgment? Do you think super forecasting as a technique also applies to super forecasting how people will do? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I, super forecasting as a technique for predicting the future. Yeah. Does it also apply to predicting how successful people will be? Um, I, yes, I, I think everything we know from, um, you know, the, the overlap between super forecasting and intelligence and the overlap between intelligence and success in various, in many different professional lines of work would suggest that is almost certainly true. Who first super forecasted your own major success? <laughs> um, I don't know what my first major success was. And some people might well, challenge whether there has been a major success in my career, but. Um, who first saw it coming? I think probably my uh, advisor at University of British Columbia, Peter Sudfeld, um, who supported me and believed in me when there didn't seem to be very many good reasons for doing so. Um, kind of a confused Canadian kid who was unsure what, what, whether to become a lawyer in Canada or go off to Oxford or go to graduate school in the U.S., and who tipped me toward, toward social science in the U.S.
And what did he see that other people had not seen? God only knows. Well, you, if anyone would know, it's you, right? <laughs> <laughs> You've lived with it for some time. I, I think he probably thought, he, I thought I was, I was um, probably bright enough to do well. And he probably thought that I was contrarian and weird enough that, that there was some possibility of doing something distinctively well, something distinctive and different and, and doing it well. Do you think acad academic advisors in general today undervalue weird students? I think there's probably a tendency in that direction, yes, because weirdness is, is, a, <laughs> is, a, is a big word. <laughs> we, we, weirdness takes lots of forms that you and I would, we would not be embarrassed about turning away lots of weird people. <laughs> sure. Do you think people who grow up with the second culture are better forecasters? Oh, you're thinking of my work with Carmi, Carmi Tudmore. Um, of course. Yeah. Gosh, you, you really looked into my Vita here. Right? <laughs> you, you, this is it's highly unusual. <laughs> Uh, I, I think there does seem to be some advantage there, yeah. And where does that come from? How does it work? I think it has to tie ties into accountability, a, accountability to conflicting audiences and value pluralism. You, you, you have a richer internal dialogue. Uh, you, you, you learn to balance conflicting perspectives more. You have to be a better perspective taker. Uh, perspective taking is a very important part of super forecasting too. How do we create more Nate Silvers and Philip Tetlocks? What should we change in the world to get more of you? Well, I think Nate and I are probably very different creatures. Um, sure, but and, we want more of you both, right? What What should we do? <laughs> um, you know, one one thing I think that would be useful. I mean, there there is this tendency for for, for training in universities to, to have become hyper professionalized and compartmentalized. Uh, so I think it is harder for for um, for people who have weird interests that straddle, say, uh, uh, psychology and organizational science and political science and law and history, the people who have we weird sets of interests, it's hard for them to get traction in the current um, career environment. Um, Certainly in, 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 in my home discipline of psychology, I mean, uh, you had this kind of rampant publication inflation in which you know, you, PhD students would be very lucky to would, would get to get a job. They'd have to have a ridiculous number of publications and some of them in A journals, uh, you know, it's the sort of thing we didn't really expect. And be, you know, 30 years ago, we thought, oh, that's a tenure case. <laughs> oh, that's a junior hire. Um, so th th those kinds of pressures, uh, I think, produce a focus, uh, a narrowing of focus. Now you say, well, yes, what you, you know, the great, like I said earlier, the, the head, the, a lot of the great advances in science come from hedgehogs. We're, 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 we're producing hedgehogs on, a, on, a, on an industrial scale here. Uh, and I, I think there, there's some advantage that may get a little bit more room for, 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 the, for uh, weirdo eclectics. And the way the departments are carved up, would you change that at all? You know, a, a number of academics in the past, like Jim March at UC Irvine, many decades ago, tried to do something like that. And, and Amy Gutman, the president of the University of Pennsylvania, is trying to do that with, uh, you know, Penn Integrates Knowledge, which is the the, the, the chaired professorships that, that were used to, to, among other things, to, to hire to hire Barb and me and hire a number of other people. And, and we are sort of floaters. You know, we, we're not we're not we're connected to one unit. We, we have multiple multiple connections. Um, so, and, and that's, so that's a very, that's a very hospitable work environment from my point of view, but I, I don't see a lot of places doing a Jim March, a UC Irvine experiment. Well, let's integrate all the social sciences together. Um, and Amy Gutman, PIK, Penn Integrates Knowledge kind of program. Um, you don't, you don't see too many of them yet. Uh, it runs against the grain. I'm not even sure it'll survive at Penn beyond Amy. I mean, the natural tendency will be for departments to want to claw back the resources. Let's say someone comes up to you and they say, Philip, I would like to be more fox-like. I'm not enough of a fox. What actual advice would you give them to achieve that? What should they do? <laughs> oh, or not do? Wake up <laughs> I mean, earlier in the morning, yeah, exercise more. Yeah, yeah, I'd either commit career suicide, become more fox-like. Um, Maybe they're not an academic. They're a smart business mm -hmm. person. How do they do this? Uh, I, I, you know, kind of obvious things like read a little bit more outside your field. If you're a liberal, read the Wall Street Journal. If you're a conservative, read, you know, read, read the New York Times. Uh, you know, expose yourself to dissonant points of view. Uh, uh, try to cultivate some interests outside your field and try to connect them together. Um, 
I think there's an optimal distance. I mean, so for history, for example, is, is, is you know, sounds in it quite very different from what I did when I started as an experimental psychologist and history looks very different, but they can be connected because historical judgment is something that psychologists study to some degree. Psychologists are interested in hindsight and counterfactuals and so forth, so you can link the two. So I think there's an optimal distance and when you go foraging as a fox, uh, you, you probably don't want to forage you know, way, way far away. You want, you want to forage far enough away that it'll be stimulating, but, but, but still possible to reconnect. What kinds of people are best at adversarial collaboration? <laughs> rare people. They, they, those are rare, rare people rare. also. <laughs> that's, but that's how do you spot really, really hard to do? <laughs> Is it a personality trait, a cognitive trait? Um, Gosh, that's a hard one. I mean, that was a, a thing that Danny, Con Danny Conham, I think, coined the term when he was, you know, dealing with his various critics over time. And my wife, Barb, actually yeah. was involved in an adversarial collaboration between the Kahneman camp and the Gigerinzer camp on the conjunction fallacy. And, uh, it took at least two or three years of her life. <laughs> it was, it's, it's a hard, it's very hard to get people to... Um, it, it, well, it, it, uh, I mean, lots of us in principle are pauperians. We believe in stating our beliefs as falsifiable hypotheses. And we also, I, most of us believe our beliefs are probabilistic. So we're kind of more, somewhat Bayesian. Um, but that's lip service. Um, there, there, there's, what we, what we, there's, there's what we believe in our, there's our formal set of, there's our epistemological formal self-concept, <laughs> which is kind of noble and falsificationist and probabilistic. And, uh, and then there's how we actually behave when our egos are at stake in particular controversies. And those things are, 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 are quite different. Um, I, I, I think uh, Danny Kahneman, who's not known as an optimist, um, you know, did propose, did propose it. It's, it sounds like an optimistic idea, but I think he, he, he's not all that optimistic about what it can achieve on close inspection. Um, I, my, my efforts at adversarial collaboration have not been all that successful. Um, I'd like to jumpstart a few of them again, but um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's very hard to find the right dance partners. Um, Let's try a question from the realm of the everyday and the mundane. If I go around and I look at Mexican restaurants, I'm very good at predicting which ones have excellent tacos. What are you good at predicting? <laughs> no, I'm not good at predicting your questions. Um, <laughs> um, what am I good at predicting? Um, I think I was pretty good at anticipating the... Um, fragility of a lot of um, micro social science knowledge prior to the replication crisis erupting. No, I mean everyday life. Oh, oh, okay. So not, 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 not in my... Not social events, not social science. What in your life are you good at predicting? When you're going to get tired and want to go to bed at night or when the dog wants to eat, what is it? Well, we, we have a pet-free existence and um, you know, we don't, our, our lives are actually pretty, pretty, pretty simple. <laughs> we, 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 you know, we, I guess we subscribe to that old adage, you should, you should be, should be, you'll be bore, boring and stayed in your life so you can be violent and creative in your work. Um, we, we, we have a kind of a routine here. So it's <laughs> we, highly we, predictable. We, 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 and, and, and now, you know, and, and in the quarantine days, I mean, it used to be pre-quarantine, you know, we said, oh, I'm, you know, let's, 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 we're going to go to Europe, we're going to go here or there. Uh, there, were, there were these little points of you know, un unpredictability that spiced up life, but you know, th 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 those do not exist right now. And two more questions to close. First, what can you tell us about your next project? Well, I think the next project is the one that I mentioned earlier. It's, it's linking historical counterfactual reasoning with conditional forecasting. I think it'll be the second phase of the focus research tournaments. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, counterfactual reasoning has for too long been the last refuge of ideological scoundrels. Um, and it'll be, uh, it, it'll be in, insofar as we can improve the stand, standards of evidence and proof in judging counterfactual claims as well as conditional forecasts and linking the two, I, I think there's a potential for improving the quality of debates among interested parties. And finally, what should a super forecaster predict about the future course of your influence? 
Oh, to be very cautious because you know we're running against the grain. We're running against the psychological grain. We're running against human nature. We're running against the sociological grain. But the, the enlightenment the, the, is stable, you tell us, right? <laughs> so if it keeps right. on accumulating and growing, your influence should be enormous. That, that, on well, your other presuppositions. Mm. Well, there, 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 there's a lot of the co there's a lot of cognitive resistance to treating one's beliefs as falsifiable, testable, uh, falsifiable, probabilistic propositions. I mean, people naturally are gra gravitate toward thinking of their beliefs as, as ego-defining, quasi-sacred possessions, and that that's one major source of uh, one major obstacle. Then you have the existing status hierarchies. You have subject matter experts who are entrenched, have influence. Why would they want to participate in exercises in which the best possible outcome is a tie? <laughs> which they, 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 re, they reaffirm that they deserve the status that they already have. Um, so that's not you know, psychological, sociological resistance. Um, you know, it's interesting, you know, the sociologists and economists have kind of different reactions to forecasting tournaments. The sociologists, the, the reaction is, you know, why would, why would anyone be naive enough to think that anyone would want to have a forecasting tournament in their organization? They're, they're status disruptive, right? Yes. And, and, and economists would say, well, if these things are so great, how come they're not everywhere? And with no. that, Philip Tetlock, thank you very much. It's been right, a pleasure. Take, take care.